It's a pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's session. Our first speaker will be Christoph Keller from Rutgers University, and his title is Constraints on Two-Dimensional Formal Field Theory Addition Functions. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing such a wonderful conference and also for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, my talk is titled Constraints on 2D Conformal Field Theory Partition Functions. It's based on basically on two papers, one with Hiroshi Oguri from last year and one with Daniel Friedan, which should come out hopefully very soon. Um, so probably the best context to give for my talk is that it's in the framework of the modern conformal bootstrap, which uh, Slava Richkov already talked about uh, on Monday. So the conformal bootstrap got revived by this uh, seminal paper by Ratazzi, Richkov, Tony, and Vici a couple of years ago. And the basic point is that you use general properties of amplitudes of conformal field theories to derive certain constraints on those theories. Um, so just Briefly to compare my talk to um, Slava Richkov's approach is um, that the main difference, there are certain differences there, but in other respects it's also very similar. So one difference is that specifically I only, only talk about two-dimensional conformal field theories. Uh, the second difference is that um, Slava and friends used crossing symmetry of the conformal four-point functions. What we're going to use here is the modular invariance of the torus amplitude of the torus vacuum amplitude of our conformal field theory. So the big advantage here is that um, quite a lot is known mathematically about modular invariance, so we can use a lot of well-developed mathematical tool to deal with that problem. So those are two differences, but sort of the goal is exactly the same, just like Slava and friends who would like to obtain bounds on the spectrum of the theory. And so this is sort of an intrinsic motivation, just if you're interested in two-dimensional conformal field theories, those are interesting questions to ask. But then there's also an extrinsic motivation. In particular, there is a relation to geometry. Um, since you can get classes of two-dimensional conformal field theories by considering nonlinear sigma model on Calabi-Yau manifolds. So the idea is that, at least in principle, it should be possible if you obtain some results on those CFTs, on the spectrum, that you can translate that somehow into statements on the geometry of calabi yau manifolds. Um, that's basically what the second part of my talk will be about, at least uh, partly. So slightly more precisely, what are we looking for? We investigate conformal field theories as a gap in the spectrum. So what we want to find is we want to find an upper bound for the lowest lying field, the lowest lying state in the theory. Um, We'll call this uh, upper bound delta one. And basically, we'll consider two different um, types of cases. Uh, one of the first one is basically just a warm up example. Um, it's where we just assume that the theory is conformal, so it is, we are Zora symmetry, but we don't make any additional assumptions about additional symmetries. And so, what we get out of there is essentially this um, gap delta one as a function of the central charge. Um, this question was already investigated by uh, Simeon Hellermann and Hellermann schmidt in a uh, series of papers. Basically, uh, it, as I, again, that's kind of a warm-up exercise, and as a bonus, we'll get um, some improvements on the bounds that they found. And then the second, um, uh, the te second types of model that we'll look at, look at are n equals 2,2 supersymmetric conformal field theories. And again, here, the motivation, as I said before, is we want to think of them as coming from calabi compactifications. And the precise question that we are asking is, what is the dimension of the lowest lying non-BPS state in this theory? So the idea is that um, between calabi and um, those sigma models, there's a relation ba between essentially the topology of the calabi and the BPS states, which means that we know a lot about BPS states, but in general, very little is known about non-BPS states. And those non-BPS states, again, would be related to the geometry of the calabi -O. So we're trying to extract something, some information on non-BPS states. So more precisely what we want, again, we want to find this gap delta. But this time, it will be a function of the Hodge numbers of the calabi -O, that is, of the topology of the calabi -O. Um, so modular invariance, I think Miranda already explained uh, where it comes from just before lunch. So essentially what we, we, we're looking at is the partition function, which is the torus um, amplitude. And it, this has to be, co so the general endpoint function will have to be covariant. The vacuum partition function will be invariant under this modular uh, group SL2Z. And the idea is, again, to combine two pieces of information that we have. We have this modular invariance on the one hand. And on the other hand, we know 
the representation theory of the symmetry, and then we combine those two things and try to extract something. Um, so, in principle, we are trying to give a fairly complete story, but um, we, we have we are still only cornering, um, covering part, uh, so a corner of the whole film thing. So. Yeah, as you know, the modular group is generated by two transformations, the S transformation and the T transformation. Actually, we'll only consider invariance under the S transformation, essentially because the T transformation is relatively simple to satisfy. So um, let's start with the Warmack example. What's going on there? Um, so the idea is that you can write this um, torus vacuum amplitude as a partition function. That is, you can expand it as a sum of um, contributions coming from the characters of the representations of the Virasoro algebra. And in particular, there's one part. So this C here is the partition function of a completely general conformal field theory of some arbitrary central charge C. And there's one piece of information we have. Um, we know this partition function contains the vacuum exactly once. And the vacuum will have a bunch of descendants, and those descendants are contained in this term here, Z0. And they're given by uh, some linear, uh, bilinear combination of left moving and right moving characters. But the, the unknown part, the rest of the partition function is a priori completely unknown. So this is going to be a bunch of um, primary fields in the theory, which have, again, some characters, some linear combination of characters, and they come with a certain multiplicity n. And what we're interested in is, in the end of the day, is those multiplicity ends and the spectrum that is for which um, values of, so h and h bar are the left and the right moving conformal weight for which values of those, there's actually non-vanishing fields. So, and sort of the, the crucial point of all this um, bootstrapping exercise is that neither z0 nor, nor the zh are by themselves modular invariant. So only if you choose an appropriate linear combination, only if you choose those ends in a very uh, clever way, will you get something which gives uh, modular invariant partition function. And as I said, we're mainly interested in gaps. So what we're trying to see if it's possible to have a spectrum where the total conformal weight h plus h bar is bigger than delta 1. So uh, as I, the main equation that we're investigating is this simple equation here, which is just um, the statement that the partition function should be invariant on the, on the DS transform. And just to, for ease of notation in the future, I'll denote the um, uh, uh, minus 1 over tau by tau tilde and all the corresponding objects also with the tilde. And then we can rewrite this equation in this form here um, by using our, the most general ansatz for the partition function. And sort of the, the central observation here is um, what is that on the right-hand side here, um, this right-hand side here is a cone, a convex cone over the space of certain functions. So the point is that the ends here count multiplicities of representations, so they have to be um, non-negative integers. In fact, in what follows, we will forget about the integer condition and just assume that they're non-negative real numbers. Again, you could probably improve on our work a bit by um, imposing these additional constraints, but so far we'll be happy with just real numbers. So this uh, forms a convex cone, and then the question is if um, we take our favorite spectrum and h h bar, um, does, the, does this, um, the, the left-hand side, so the vacuum contribution, does this um, vacuum contribution actually lie in the, in the cone? So um, to give you a sort of a, a picture of what's going on, um, we, we take this um, particular cone given by the spectrum, uh, which has a certain gap delta 1, and to this spectrum correspond a certain cone. And if we choose delta 1, very small, then there's a potentially a lot of um, states in the spectrum. So the cone is very broad, and there's a good chance that uh, the vacuum contribution uh, is in the cone. But as we make delta 1 bigger and bigger, the cone gets narrower and narrower. And at some point, um, the vacuum contribution will lie outside the cone. And so the way we'll go up, so basically everything boils down to checking whether the vacuum contribution is in the cone or not. And one way to check that is, certainly if we can find a linear functional on the space of our functions, which, um, so geometrically if you can find a hyperplane which separates the cone from this point here, or in terms of linear functional, if we can find a linear functional which is positive on the cone and which is also positive on this contribution here, then we know we're in this situation here and there is a contradiction, so this spectrum will give something inconsistent. 
That's, that's the basic idea. And in this case, um, delta 1 is, if we get, if we're in this picture here, then, well, in this case, I guess it's delta 3 is an upper bound for the gap. So uh, let me just give you a brief slide about some simplifications. In principle, the problem is set up now and we could start, but there are some very nice simplifications which you can use, which come from the fact that um, the representation of theory of the Verizon algebra is relatively compatible with uh, modular invariants. So in particular, if you write down the characters of uh, a general representation, which is not the vacuum representation, you can see that it's almost modular invariant by itself. So basically, the only problem with it is it's one over the eta function, essentially. And the only problem is that there's a q to the h prefactor, which destroys modular invariants. And similar for the vacuum representation, it's also almost the eta function. There's an additional 1 minus q to um, which comes from the fact that the L minus 1 state annihilates the vacuum. But if you look at this, then it's relatively clear that it's, sh it's a clever idea to redefine a partition function by multiplying eta with eta square. And then actually, so we want something which is invariant under the S transformation. Um, the, the eta function has a weight 1 half. So you want to compensate this thing here. Uh, that's why you get this uh, mod tau to the 1 half. And then writing this thing down, you can easily check that it is, in fact, invariant under the S transformation. And the advantage of this thing is that now when we look at the contribution, the reduced contributions of the vacuum and the primary fields, it's really just um, uh, polynomial, well, monomials in Q and Q bar plus some prefactor. So it's a really, really simple expression. OK. So now what do we want to do? We want to. Um, investigate the space of linear functionals because we want to check if there is a linear functional which separates the cone from the vacuum contribution. And first, let's do some simplification. Um, let's restrict to tau being uh, purely imaginary. So we only, that leaves one real number beta in the space. And so one way of systematically investigating the dual space of the functions is by considering a Taylor expansion around the point beta equals 1. Or to put it in another way, so you want to read off Taylor coefficients, that's certainly a linear functional on the space of functions. To put it another way, what you, want, what you can do is you can act with differential operators of, say, of this form here on some contribution and then evaluate that um, expression at beta equals 1. And now, the, the reason why this is a good idea is because of the following um, observation. If you go back to the expression of the reduced characters, you see that for the, um, for a the uh, primary field of weight h and h bar, the, the weight actually only appears as q to the h and q bar to the h bar. So you can easily check if you act with such a differential operator on the thing. What you get is you get some polynomial in delta, where delta is defined as the sum of the two uh, conformal weights, times some, um, times some uh, exponential factor, which does not depend on the details of the, of the differential operator. So as you remember, what we wanted to uh, look at, what we were looking for is uh, our um, linear functions which are positive on the cones. And now this pro problem has reduced to finding polynomials which are positive uh, on the cone, which means this polynomial here should be positive if the argument is bigger than delta 1. So it should be positive for delta bigger than delta 1. So we've reduced the problem of finding positive um, uh, uh, linear functionals to the problem of certain positivity properties of uh, polynomials. Now, the thing is, um, this is uh, a very nice thing because um, there is a, a, a theorem um, due to Hilbert that you can write any, um, uh, any polynomial which, which has this property, which is positive for x bigger than x1 in this form here, where this vector x is given by 1, x, x squared, et cetera, up to some order x to the, I call it an r minus 1. And then this other factor, and then this other term here, x minus x1 times a similar expression, where those two matrices, um, y1 and y2, are um, an r times an r matrices, and they're positive semi-definite. Uh, I mean, it's easy to check that this is actually positive definite, and also this by itself is positive definite. So if x is bigger than x1, then this will be positive definite. And actually, the, the converse is also true. So you can always parameterize it in this way. So why is this a good thing? Um, the, good, the thing is, so now we've, um, the problem reduces. So if we are, if we are scanning over all, so we, are, we, we try to find a, um, 
to, to, we're trying to find a separating linear functional. So we're scanning over all these positive semi-definite matrices. And we automatically know that such functionals are positive on the cone by construction here. So the only thing remaining to check is that it's actually also positive when it acts on the vacuum. And the point is that this, is a type of, this type of problem is very well understood in mathematics. It's, uh, it's, uh, so you can use, uh, what we're going to use is a um, semi-definite programming algorithm called the STPA solver um, developed by um, these gentlemen here, uh, which is exactly designed to deal with such a problem. So you're maximizing a certain function over a space um, of positive semi-definite matrices subject to certain constraints. So sort of we've, we've outsourced all the heavy lifting now to this, um, to this STPA solver. And now we can have a brief look at the results. So basically what we're doing is we're fixing the order of the differential operator and then we are varying the coefficient of the differential operator and then uh, see what kind of bound we get. So this is a plot of the bound delta 1 as a function of C. And the top line here is the original bound found by Simeon Hellermann. And in this case, what he did is he considered simply an order three differential operator. And he got this bound here, which asymptotically is delta one is C over six. Uh, now we're doing a more systematic approach. And so we can crank up the order of the differential operator up to whatever, 23. And you can see that there is a, a definite improvement in the bound. Uh, just as a small side remark, uh, you can actually show that there is a uh, uh, you can never do better than this particular thing here, uh, than this line here. So we are kind of getting like halfway to the theoretically best bound. Now this picture looks very nice. In particular, it seems to imply that asymptotically the you know the the, the, the slopes are different. So the leading behavior asymptotically differs. But unfortunately, the it seems like the slope for really large um, central charges like ten thousand or so. It seems to the the slope seems to converge to the same value of one over six. OK, so now let's turn to the n equals 2, 2 case and to Calabi out geometry. So um, what we're going to do here, we're considering the nervous schwartz nervous schwartz sector of the partition function of such a uh, conformal field theory is n, n equals 2, 2 supersymmetry. And now what we're looking at is not just the ordinary partition function, but the generalized partition function, which has an additional um, uh, variable uh, inserted coming from the Cartan generator of the U1, R symmetry J0. So it's a function um, of tau and of, of C. And the point is that, again, this object here has nice transformation properties under the S transform in particular. It picks up some phases, but essentially it's invariant. So now actually what we're doing, what we want to do is we want to consider not just um, n equals 2, 2 supersymmetry, but so-called extended n equals 2, 2 supersymmetry. Again, the geometric motivation is that if you consider a nonlinear sigma model on a Calabi Yau manifold, it's not just n equals 2, 2 supersymmetry, but because of the holomorphic uh, d, 0 form, there's an addition enhanced symmetry. So that's where this extended comes from. And luckily, this representation theory has been worked out in great detail by Odake in the 80s. And what's really helpful for us is that in, in this case, you, you get only two families of uh, representation. Well, first of all, you get um, long non-BPS representation or massive representation. Then you also get short or massless BPS representations. Um, they are, again, so the long representations are uh, characterized by the weight of the primary field and also by the U1 charge of the primary field. Uh, the nice thing is that this U1 charge only takes a finite number of values. So there's a finite number of such representations here. And the same is also true for the BPS representations. There's only a finite number of such representations. So in total, um, when we want to write down the partition functions, the generalized partition functions before, there will be um, three different parts. Um, there will be a half BPS part, a quarter BPS part, and a non-BPS part, or a massive part. And so in, initially in, in, in the Virozoro problem, what we knew in the partition function, what we knew about the partition function was this, was this set zero part, so the vacuum contribution. Now in this case here, from the topology of the Calabi R, we know the, the half BPS part, and from the elliptic genus, we also know the quarter BPS part. So in this case here, those two things are known, but this thing here is unknown. And again, our goal will be from using the information contained in, these, in this part here to uh, learn something about the uh, something about the, uh, the non-BPS part here. 
Okay, now, um, so a priori what you could do is, um, now we have a function which is, uh, depends on two variables, a tau and z, so you could try to repeat what you did before, so consider a differential operator in tau and then also differential operators in z and then just optimize over that. But actually there's a very nice and simpler way of doing that which uses the fact that um, actually the characters are invariant on the spectral flow, um, or covariant on the spectral flow, so in particular this means that the characters are quasi periodic so there's this relation here, and then you can use Hermit's lemma, which tells you that actually the space of such functions as functions of z is a finite dimensional. So which means you can always write um, any function as some linear combination of this with coefficients which are tau valued. And in particular, what we want to do is we want to make uh, a smart choice for this basis, which is, turns out to be this choice here, which is essentially some data functions. And the reason why we want to make this particular choice is that this these objects here actually have very nice transformation properties under the modular group. So in particular, under the S transformation, um, it's just a vector, vector valued representation. So this um, helps a lot. Let's again define a reduced partition function by taking into account uh, um, the phase that we had, and then also a bunch of um, eta functions just to make life a bit simpler. And then what what you end up with is this expression here, which tells you that you can express this reduced partition function as uh, the vector, uh, uh, an inner product of the, the, the basis vectors that we had chosen with some matrix M, M, which now importantly is only a function of tau. So all the Z dependence has been dumped into those vectors here. And we've reduced the problem of investigating an object which, which depends on tau and z to a problem of investigating a matrix which only depends on tau. And again, coming from my previous remark, you can decompose this M into a contribution of massive and BPS states. And invariance on dress is then equivalent to um, satisfying this condition here. And actually, we only did the concrete computations for the uh, Calabio threefold case. Um, for so that one reason is that's the most interesting case for string theorists. But the second reason is also that in this case, there's actually a simplification of the problem. So it, the, the, all the matrices become block diagonal. And in particular, if you look at those matrices here, you see again, they have a very, very nice and simple structure. It's again only a monomial in Q and Q bar plus some prefactor here. And also some very, very simple expressions here from the BPS state. And then essentially what this means is we can, now the, we are considering the dual space and um, the dual space in this case is just given by um, uh, D minus one times D minus one or D times D matrices of differential operators acting using the usual in, in a product. And so basically what, I mean the, the takeaway is that it's, it's just a, um, it's, it's exactly the same techniques that, you, that we used in the bosonic case. And so now we can, um, I can show you the results, what you get out of it. So again, this is a plot of um, delta one as a function of H total, which is the total Hodge number, which is H11 plus H21. And so again, the idea is that there has to be a non-BPS state below this line uh, for the theory to be consistent. And as you can see, as you go up in the order of the differential operator, um, the bound becomes slightly better, but not by much. So essentially what this tells you is that there has to be a non-BPS state of conformal weight uh, lower than 0.6 or slightly, something slightly lower. Um, okay, so in a sense, uh, what originally we were most interested in was um, the behavior for large H total. And what we had hoped for initially is that the bound would become negative, which would have ruled out um, Calabi-Aus, which very large Hodge numbers. Unfortunately, it turns out that the bound, um, the bound um, has some totals to, towards uh, one half. So in this, we can make some predictions about some statements about the geometry of Calabi-Aus, but not exactly what we were hoping for. Okay, I guess I'll stop here. We, we haven't, but I mean it would be absolutely straightforward to do. Um, I, my guess would be that your constraints would be slightly weaker because you know you don't have 2,2 supersymmetry anymore. But I mean the technology is definitely here, so one can do it. Other questions? If not, let's thank our speaker again.